The state of law enforcement has come a long way since I was a young cadet joining the police force back in the UK. Advancements in technology have informed change in the way we share information and have greatly increased the accuracy of forensics. Unfortunately, these advancements haven't helped as rapidly on the one issue I've spent my career exposing, corruption. This week I'll be talking to my friend Chris, a former career criminal, about some of the most unbelievable acts of police corruption that we've witnessed over the years and how technology has completely changed how we operate on both sides of the law. From Storic Media, you're listening to Codename Siren, a true crime podcast with Nina Hobson. Obviously, I'm in a different country now to when I was policing. And I, as you know, I was really, really proud to be a good cop. And I'm really, really anti-bad policing. Hence why I had the experiences that I did. But moving to LA, it's been a whole different world. Or moving to America. And I'm involved in a couple of things now where I'm seeing very clearly corruption, which is something that I have heard about being in the UK, you know, the American police force, it's corrupt, it's this. And I was like, hell, it's not, no different from anywhere else in the world. But I am now seeing cases where I'm looking at it going, this is a corrupt police force. And then I look at the training and the recruitment and then it's like, is there any wonder it's a corrupt police force? And I don't know whether you're aware of the big thing that happened in LA where there was a police gang and, you know, you had to have your tattoo and to be allowed to be in that. And and I'm like, how is this even possible? Like, we're we're talking about a police gang and it's allowed to happen? If someone knows there's a police gang, how is it still in existence? I mean, again, I stand by the, the British police that it's a whole different level. And in fact, you know, one of the really sad things for me was when my daughter said, I don't ever admit to anyone in America you're an ex cop. And I was so proud of you being a cop in Britain. I don't admit it to anyone because everyone hates cops here. And that was really sad for me, that moment. But, I mean, you've been backwards and forwards to America. You've been involved with police in different parts of the world. What are your experiences of corruption? So first of all, the States. I mean, yeah, what you've just told me doesn't surprise me at all. Um... The, the cops in the States, I mean, the, the experience I've had, they do seem a bunch of fucking bullies. There's no accountability. Just because they're some fat fucker with a gun and they've got a load of people backing them up, they're a law unto themselves. I mean, obviously, the George Floyd incident was just one of many, many, many examples of them doing exactly what they fucking want. You've got no time or respect for them at all. With the British police force, again, no respect for them. Um, I mean, I caught them, I've actually caught them falsifying evidence and faking forensics. And I know they did it because I committed the crime myself. And they fitted some poor sod up. I want to hear all about that. And then I have some really good questions for you about that. Okay, so the whole incident was, um, this was an insurance scam. So... The scam was I took out an amazing insurance policy on my house. I left it a couple of years. And then two years later, my house gets uh, gets burgled. So what I did was a week before, I got all of my valuable possessions, took them out of my house, hid them um, in a lockup I had. And then the day before, I, I messed the house up. I did exactly what a burglar would do. There's certain things. Burglars don't go for big TVs, but there's certain things they would do. So... I set the house up so it looks like I've been robbed. Um, On the night in question, I broke in the back doors, uh, walked out the front door, but I had a cast iron alibi for the whole night. So I've got home at four o'clock in the morning, looked at my house, ah, I've been burgled. So I've called the cops. The cops come and they're looking around the house and they say, yeah, you've been probably burgled. And there was a um, one of the cops, this uh, lady, WPC, She's on her walkie-talkie thing, and she's talking. She went, oh, it looks like we've got the fella that did it. I said, 
Right. She went, yeah, we've just arrested a man red-handed robbing somebody else's house and we think he robbed yours. I said, oh, right, okay, but I'm playing on Navy thinking, yeah, but this is too good to be true. So, um... So, yeah, we we're pretty sure it was him because it sounds like his MO that he'd do this place and that place, even though it's a completely different part of town. A few days later, the police came back and said, yeah, we've proved it was him that robbed your house. I said, how'd you prove that? They said, well, he had these little bits of white paint on his jumper and we took paint samples from your back doors uh, and matched the forensics up to the paint samples on his jumper and proved it was him that broke in the back of your house. And I thought, you fucking lying bastard. This poor son has been nowhere near my house. I did it myself. But I couldn't say that. But it's, I think it's a numbers game with the police. You've, they've now got two crimes that are solved. Um, and anybody, you know, anybody I know that's, that's done time, they'll get nicked for something. And then all the other cases that are similar, they then get all those lumps on their, on their shoulders as well. So if somebody gets done for robbing a house, they get done for robbing 15 houses. And that way, the police can say, we've solved all these crimes. So, um, yeah, so the police, they falsified evidence to fit up some poor fella who was robbing some other house anyway. But, um, yeah, they stitched him so up. So who cares? Is that the yeah. sentiment? Who cares? He was doing somebody at house, so who cares? Exactly, which isn't a nice thing to do. I was only robbing an insurance company. But it did me a favour because now the insurance company aren't looking at me because the police have already got the fella. So it it works out best for everyone. So it's a a win-win except for the guy who got sent to prison for not robbing your house. Exactly. But the thing is, I mean, he was robbing somebody else's ass anyway. I'm just going to go back through that. And and again, it's so funny because our... Our minds are so different because of what we've we've done. Um, and I, I just want to touch on the numbers game thing. I mean, when I left the police, it was really, it was in a in the UK, it was in a, ch- a point of change. And it was about numbers. And as a detective, you know, somebody would get arrested and go to prison for something. And then we would go and interview them in prison and, and put every house robbery that happened in the last, and unsolved in the last, two years to them and say, you know, did you do this, whether there was evidence or not. And sometimes you got real lucky and somebody said yes to everything because they got life or they really didn't care or they wanted to tell everyone that they'd done all of these crimes when they'd probably only done one. But we were happy. We got it, what they called written off. So it definitely, and it became more of that because in the UK, it became a case of you only got your bonus at the end of the year if you did this amount of detections and this amount of charges and this amount of people. And that was one of the reasons I left. It was like there was no discretion. I couldn't just go up to someone who was pissing up a wall and take them home and know their dad was going to give them a belt around the ear. I had to arrest that person or give them a ticket because that was what my wages then depended on and yeah I mean there's a whole another day that we can talk about that funny enough you say that I actually did get arrested for urinating in a public place was it me did I arrest you because I would have done this wasn't if this wasn't in your area this was the first time I ever went to court yeah it was a magistrate's court and it was well I'll tell you how long ago it was I got a 15 pound fine and 25 pound court costs but what what a waste of time and money pissing up a doorway yeah, but that, I mean, that in those days, that was when we were allowed discretion and then discretion went. But um, so let's take, let's go back to the crime that you did that somebody else got found guilty on. I just want to go more into that because I think it's fascinating. So you took insurance out. Yes. I mean, let's be honest, if criminals did use their brains for really good stuff, it would be amazing because you took insurance out on a property with the the intent that in two years' time you were going to rob your own house? Yes. Now, with normal home policies in England, say you insure your contents for 40 grand. I don't know what it's like at the moment. So at the time, you think I'm covered for 40 grand's worth of um, of, of contents. But in the small print, it will say high-risk items, 15 grand, and the rest is not high-risk items. Well, high-risk items is pretty much anything that's going to get fucking stolen. So you think you're insured for 40 grand, you're only actually insured for 15 grand. Okay, so I had, I had a policy taken out, so my high-risk items was a lot higher. 
Also, the things that got stolen was just really random things that wouldn't be um, high risk. I also had a beautiful, very expensive gold diamond ring that I had a valuation on uh, that got stolen. The ironic thing is, this ring has been stolen three times. It's never existed. There was a jeweller that I know, so I'd pay a dodgy jeweller to write me up um, a valuation on a, on a piece of jewellery that doesn't exist, take out a special a special clause in my insurance policy saying, saying I've got a very expensive piece of jewellery, here's the valuation, so that gets added to it. So, um, yeah, so that was the policy I took out. So it was a higher, high risk, and it had this special piece of jewellery in it. So it's it's kind of, I mean, it's a sophisticated thing. I mean, it was premeditated. It was planned to the point of, you know, finding the dodgy jeweller. And obviously, I say that, and that's not that hard in the world you live in. Um, looking at the insurance policy, knowing how it all works, and then um, saying, okay, I'm going to do this in a couple of years' time. I'm not going to take a policy out now and do it tomorrow because then somebody's going to start asking questions. So there's a lot of thought gone into this. Um, was there any thought gone into what if I do get caught? What happens there? I mean, it's insurance fraud, but with your background and other other things that you'd done, did you ever think, oh, I'm going to get caught? Or, or was, was your mindset totally, well, I've got this, the police are dickheads? Uh, at, that, at that incident, no. I was, it was funny. Um, when the police turned up, I was, I was almost, almost like a method actor. I was the victim. I was heartbroken because somebody has broken into my home. And I actually felt like I'd been robbed. It wasn't until after they left, I'd given myself a little, give it a little snigger, and I thought, oh, that worked out quite nicely. But, um, but no, there was no, there's, there's only one time in my life when I think I've been scared. I did something uh, a few years later, and this was another insurance scam, but a very different type of thing. Um, but they knew something was wrong. I've since found out that my name is known at Lloyd's of London. And I think they put two and two together, sent an investigator down. Um, he found out that what I said, certain parts of it, was untrue. And then I had a six-month investigation over me. At the same time, I took my 19, beautiful 1967 Mustang out for a spin, drunk, and drove it into a wall. I got chased by the cops. I managed to get away from that. And I can remember sitting in a hotel room in Paris thinking, fuck, you know, I'm going to get done for the Mustang. I'm going to get done for this insurance fraud. If I am not in prison in 12 months' time, it'll be a fucking miracle. And there's just the weight. I think I don't know which one to worry about more because the insurance thing, they interviewed everyone, just literally anybody that was slightly, slightly associated. When it was quite an elaborate thing that I did, anybody slightly associated with it, uh, including one lady that was in hospital, they interviewed her in hospital, um, just trying their hardest to, to trip me up on that one. And, yeah, and I was actually amazed that I got away with all of that. And after that, I thought, family, that was a lucky scape. And then did something else, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as soon as I got away with it, right, right, what's next? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like a gambler, right? They win once and then they keep on gambling. <laughs> well, it's, it's almost like, yeah, I'm not a religious man, but it's almost like praying, dear God, if I get away with this, I'll never do it again. And then I got away with it. So, um, <laughs> and then, yeah, did something else. I want to just go back to that first one. So um, you said that you made it look like it was a burglary because you understood what a burglary would look like. I mean, somebody like, I don't know, who hasn't had my background, I understand what a burglary scene looks like I understand what murder scene looks like and because that's when I have to start investigating um but you understand it from a different perspective so you said that you left the house like it had been burgled and I think it's called something different burglarized in America which is crazy um and you didn't take things like TVs and what I mean was that because you didn't really need to because you were going to claim enough stuff anyway no because if somebody's breaking into your home they want to be in and out. They don't want to be lugging big. And in these days, TVs weren't the small little slimline things. They were quite big things. 
And a thief isn't going to be trying to, you know, walk out to his van carrying this big thing. So it's more sort of smaller, um, you know, highly priced items that they're going to go for rather than a big, massive TV. And and so you said that you had a cast iron alibi. Is there a, lots of thought that went into that as much as into the actual crime and, you know, the, the premeditation of that? What was your alibi? And how hard was it? I can't say what, what my alibi was, but it was just 100% so cast iron because I was in this place and I'm on loads of cameras in this place. That was my next question. Was this like, I mean, the days of cameras because that's changed everything? It, yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, what, what I did, I could never do now. Why? Right. <laughs> Remember an hour ago when we were trying to work out how to fucking have a Zoom meeting and me and you were sitting there like a couple of fucking idiots um, trying to download shit and work out, oh, we says download, how do I download stuff? That, the whole world is completely different, isn't it? Yeah, it is completely different and there's a reason you have kids, right, so that they can take you through the technology, or allegedly, yeah. but mine are <laughs> useless too, but... But talking about that, crime has changed, obviously, and I I talk a lot about scammers because there's so many scammers. And for me, obviously, personally, on a dating app, the dating app, app scammer is the thing that jumps straight to mind. But, I mean, what uh, interesting as a criminal, what effects that's had on on you and what your thoughts are now? Fucking technology. It's put me out of work. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't have a I wouldn't have a clue where to say. I mean. My, you know, my computer knowledge is I can go on Facebook, I can send an email and I like a poll. That's pretty much it. I don't know how to download things and then set up scams and, yeah, anything to do with, I mean, banks and building societies now, they put a lot of, you know, money in fighting cybercrime. I wouldn't have a clue where to start. I might as well be, you know, talking Japanese and doing brain surgery wouldn't have a clue where to start with it. So they are now, so whereas I was always a couple of steps ahead of the police, now there'd be so many steps ahead of me. Um, even just like if I'm on the run, whereas, you know, we spoke about before one needs to disappear. Now you can't disappear. You know, it's so hard. I um, mean, UK is so cameraed up. It's just virtually impossible to to disappear if they really want to find you. So basically, technology has stopped you being a criminal. That and my uh, my new fan set of morals. <laughs> okay, it's so the technology. <laughs> so technology. <laughs> but on that point, actually, and you've probably not seen this, but there's a case right now in America where um, a mother of three was killed. I think it was about the fourth of January, and they just came out where they were looking at the at the husband. And he was a big art fraud person. So he was already on um, whatever they call, you know, where they keep you locked in your house, which we don't have in England, um, for this art fraud. And his wife was killed. And they just came out, literally, I think it was yesterday, to say that the police had looked at his internet and his searches and his history, and it shows that just before she died, he was looking how to dispose of a 115-pound body. Now, <laughs> why 115-pound? <115 laughs> like, idiot. Is, right. But, and again, my point is that doesn't make him guilty at all because, you know, we've all looked at stuff. Jesus, please never want to only look at my history because obviously looking at crimes and stuff and I've worked in the, in, yeah. the, in the sex trafficking world. It doesn't, make him a crim it doesn't make him a murderer. However, it does give a lot of intel and a different direction to the police that that was... I mean, there's also stuff that he, he left his house arrest and he went to the Home Depot in fully mask. And we're not, I mean, masks was the best thing for a criminal ever, COVID. Um, and he bought all uh, like $500 worth of cleaning fluids and bleaches and everything the, the day before she died. So, I mean, and that's, they've got on camera. So I think that's, it's a really good point that you're saying, you know, I mean, criminals still get away with stuff. There's no doubt about that. But it's, it's a really interesting take that that's what, 
what the police and the avenue that the police are taking. You know, years ago when I was policing, I would never think to look at somebody's history on the internet because it was very limited. Well, I was involved in something a few years ago. Um, basically, there was a, a nasty fella and he owed somebody some money. So they asked me to go down and, and I went down and the bloke was a fucking arsehole and got slapped around a bit. The guy that I did the job for got arrested. But the first thing they did was take his phone and they can go on the, your location and they can see everywhere that that phone's been. And they like, they look to see what communication, what phone calls, texts, WhatsApp, because even if you delete shit, they can find it. And so if they'd found me straight away, they were seeing on location services that I was there. And it wasn't until after that I realised that that was even a thing. So... If you ever commit a crime, if you've got your phone with you, your phone has just dropped you in it because I think you can turn your location services off. But when you're a, a fucking idiot like me and don't know how to work an iPhone properly, then um, you, you don't know how to do these things. You're screwed. You're screwed. I think it's probably best that you don't actually leave your house anymore. <laughs> probably for the best, yes. Probably for the best. It's encouraging to know that advancements in technology have made crime much more difficult to commit than decades before. We hope it also brings change to how law enforcement hold one another accountable for their own misconduct. Our plan is to continue the dialogue on police corruption and encourage others to speak out and tell their stories as well. Because without exposing the corrupt individuals involved, we may never see the much needed change. Until next time, I'm Nina Hobson, and this has been Codename Siren. Siren.